So there's this episode of Casper the Friendly Ghost I used to watch all the time as a kid. And if you've seen any episode of the show, you know they start out the same way. Casper has trouble fitting in with the other ghosts because they like scaring people, but he does not. Instead, he wanders among the living, hoping to find a friend, but it doesn't matter how friendly a ghost you are when every mortal is afraid of you. I'm Casper. <laughs> So he's sad until he meets a fox he names Ferdy. Uh, 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 aren't you uh, 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 scared of me? Casper and Ferdy become friends, but unfortunately during a game of hide and seek, Ferdy is shot and killed by fox hunters. Ferdy, 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 are you all right? And it's absolutely heartbreaking. Until you remember that Casper is a ghost, and now so is Ferdy, and so... Oh, Ferdy! They live happily ever after. And so, Casper and Ferdy lived happily ever after. But when I think about this episode now, I'm struck with this weird sense of melancholy. Because now that I'm older and can obsessively overthink minutia, I found it weird that the episode boils down to people cannot comfortably befriend ghosts unless they also become ghosts. It's really strange that a children's show about a friendly ghost would take this position, and I don't doubt that in later episodes Casper does make friends with living children who understand he's not to be feared. But the idea of a ghost and human both desiring but ultimately failing to coexist under the powers that be stuck with me for a really long time. Hurry, Mom! If we don't get to the convention soon, all the good comics will be gone! Oh, uh, what do you care about good comics? All you ever buy is Casper the Wimpy Ghost. I think it's sad that you equate friendliness with wimpiness, and I hope it'll keep you from ever achieving true popularity. Well, you know what I think? I think Casper's the ghost of Richie Rich. Hey, they do look alike! And these themes that embody this adult and admittedly tragic perspective of Casper is frequently adopted by director Paul Thomas Anderson. His characters are lost until they are welcomed into a surrogate family, they are flawed and naive, and are often driven by the desire for recognition and human connection, but ultimately do not change. And that's true, I think that ties up the man's career pretty well. I also agree that his characters don't change, at least not by having a revelation that reshapes who they once were. But I think his characters do change from rejecting who they are to accepting who they are. So this is the first shot of Paul Thomas Anderson's 2012 film, The Master. It's one of my favorite shots of any of his films for a couple of reasons. For one thing, it's mesmerizing. I like the shapes that the water makes, and there's a subtle color gradient of blues that get darker around the edges of the screen. It just looks awesome. But I also like this shot because it functions as a framing device for our main character's internal arc. That main character is Freddy Quell, a sailor who is struggling to re-enter society after World War II ends. Now we only get a brief glimpse of life as a sailor for Freddy and his unit, but what we do see ends up revealing a lot about who they are. We see sailors wrestling over here, they're sculpting naked women in the sand over there, Freddy's getting totally sloshed, mixing drinks of coconut juice and engine fluid and paint thinner, and he just drank paint thinner. Oh God! All this aggression and drinking and violent sand finger blasting are vices that broken individuals like these sailors latch onto for comfort and self-medication. And, and one thing that we, uh, that Joaquin came up with and found was um, for a lot of these sailors that had been in the war that when they, when they came back from the war they felt, they felt very aimless because they didn't have any uh, commander anymore. You know, that they, they liked being in the war. They enjoyed 
the, the part of the military that was very structured, that gave them a commander, that if they had a commander that they connected to, they liked very much. They really liked working for him. They liked um, being guided. And to come back to reality, real or not reality, but to come back to home and life back here, to not have that um, is very disorienting. Like most soldiers, Freddie has been psychologically affected by the war, and therefore must stay in a psychiatric ward before he returns to a normal life. For this sequence, Paul Thomas Anderson takes heavy inspiration from 1946's Let There Be Light, a documentary by John Huston. Centering on the treatment for psychologically affected soldiers returning home, Let There Be Light contains brutally honest and emotional recountings of trauma. And while it is really sad, it's absolutely worth watching if you have any interest in this subject. In other words, homesickness. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. It was induced when shortly before the war. I received a picture of my sweetheart. Yes. I'm sorry, I can't continue. That's all right. The fella, the, the black guy is talking about his wife, you know, that letter. Um, it just doesn't get any more, more harrowing. Or, or, so seeing somebody like that, so vulnerable and so naked, you just never, you never, saw, you never saw that. Sort of uh, fellas from that era that came back, you just never saw them kind of bearing their souls. And I'd never seen anything like that. Anderson's inspiration was so intense that he just steals shots and lines of dialogue from the documentary and just puts them in the master. It was brought on by a letter I, I received from a girl I knew once. I think I really suffered what a new in your profession you call nostalgia. <laughs> it was nostalgia that was brought on by a letter I received. Uh, I believe in your profession is called nostalgia. In other words, homesickness. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. It was induced when shortly before the war. I received a picture of my sweetheart. You can start a business, filling station, grocery, or hardware store, get a few acres of land and raise some chickens, go back to school. A man might open a filling station or a hardware store. Or he can buy a few acres of land and raise some chickens. He might even go back to school. When you get to the end of this documentary and you watch the soldiers picking up their certificates and leaving on the bus, the feeling you're supposed to be left with is, now these men are ready to return to work and make a living. The one idea that John Houston went into was to go to this um, a VA hospital and as a way to help show potential employers for these fellows that were coming back from the war that these guys who, who were shell-shocked, who were completely damaged, could be employed, they, they could get a job, and you should not be afraid of them and, and all that they've gone through. The irony and the joke of it was is that one look at this, I mean, you wouldn't have hired any one of these guys, you know, because they were, they were complete, they were a mess. And, they, and they, the idea was that in six to eight weeks, they could turn them around and ship them back out after being away for, you know, between two to four years, you know, you could, you could, you could clean somebody up with a brush, like, in six to eight weeks, and as madness, it was nuts, you know. And what happened to the movie? I mean, the, the movie... Yeah, they said, no way, get this movie out of here, we're not showing this movie, absolutely not, um, this is not helping what we've just gone through, or what people need to feel, which is probably ridiculous too. I mean, it probably would have incited a lot more compassion for what was going on, but I think that generation, the impression was, you've won, so buck up and be tough, and, and now, you know, come back and get a job. Once released, Freddie tries to make a living, but his erratic, animalistic behavior and alcoholism prevent him from fitting in. So, while wandering the streets at night, with nowhere in particular to go, he stows away on the Aletheia, a ship commanded by Lancaster Dodd, a man who is forming a religious movement known as The Cause. Dodd offers Freddy a route to treating his internal pain through a kind of hypnosis therapy. 
And it's only fitting that this session takes place on this ship, this ship called the Aletheia, which translates from Greek to disclosure or truth. Dodd's religion attempts to achieve two goals. One, to unearth and confront past trauma, not just in present lives, but also past lives people may have already lived through, and to civilize people out of their survivalist primal behaviors. <laughs> Freddy, stop! We find out that Freddy's trauma existed long before his career as a sailor, originating within his father who died from alcohol poisoning and his mother who was admitted to a psych ward, and surviving in the guilt he harbors from abandoning a girl back home, Doris. Unsurprisingly, these events comprise of alcohol, sex, and violence, echoing the same vices that plague his life now. So when Freddy gives one of his ex-coworkers alcohol poisoning after claiming that he reminds him of his father, we gain more understanding of the good that Dot is trying to spread through his brand of trauma therapy. So from a scene like this, we know that if left dormant, past trauma can violently reappear when you least expect it. Now learning all this information from only one conversation should be taxing for any audience, but luckily Anderson's writing combined with amazing performances from Joaquin Phoenix and the late Philip Seymour Hoffman creates a tense emotional atmosphere. One of my favorite things about Paul Thomas Anderson is that he's just as skilled at writing small things like this isolated conversation as he is at finding the grand imagery that ties everything together. Which brings us back to this shot. So how does Anderson use this to frame the master? Well, it appears three times in total, and each time its meaning changes. So when the movie opens with this shot, the only thing we can assume is that we as an audience are now traveling to another time and place. When we see it again, we've learned that Freddy regrets leaving to go to war because he abandoned a relationship with Doris. The last time we see this shot is right after Freddy reconnects with Doris's family and accepts that their ship has sailed. This is a great way to structure a narrative, and when a movie has a lot of ideas going on under the surface, it's valuable to have a technique like this to help ground the audience. And so the movie becomes this meditation on civil people like Lancaster Dodd and people who are animals like Freddie Quell. Dealing with opposite characters is familiar territory for someone like Anderson. We see a similar dynamic appear in Punch Drunk Love, where Barry Egan's nervous, bottled up energy plays well against Lena Leonard's calming, empathetic embraces. In There Will Be Blood, I cannot think of two professions more opposite than a ruthless oil man and a small town pastor. And while on the surface they are opposites from one another, the master and Freddy form a comfortable dominant and submissive bond, and the more their friendship grows, the more they exhibit each other's character traits. Throughout the film we can watch Freddy become a little more civilized, while Dodd has these explosions of anger whenever his philosophies are questioned or ridiculed. This motif of animals appears throughout the movie. You get the title for one thing, Masters Take in Wild Animals and Domesticate Them, which is Dodd's desire for Freddy in a nutshell. Joaquin and I were always talking about apes and animals and things like that for his character in that film, and I showed him the first shot of Barack. I don't know if anybody's seen it, it's gonna be boring, but there's a great shot about good, all right. I remember the first shot, it's a monkey, sorry, it's a monkey um, in the snow and he's falling asleep. It's just, and it's really, it must, must take like two minutes, you know, just to stare at this monkey slowly falling asleep. And it is absolutely hypnotizing. One of the best things I've ever seen. And I showed it to him one day and I said, you know, and he just loved it too. I said, let's try and do that. So. And there are so many other things in this movie that lead back to this idea, but I just want to focus on one scene in particular where they're in the desert in Arizona playing Pick a Point. 
The game, if you could even call it a game, is pretty self-explanatory. You pick a point and then ride out to it. So Dodd picks a point, he rides out, whoops and hollers, and then rides back. Freddy gets on and he rides out to a mountain on the horizon, like really far away. After a while, the master starts to get nervous. Because for him, this is like letting your dog out on a longer and longer leash. Once they get a taste of freedom, they might decide to run away. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. He, yeah, he, he, yeah. Some, some, uh, I guess he's somebody probably that is um, that considers that, that has probably moved through most of his life alone, or sort of learned to survive alone. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't completely hunger or desire to be around people or to be part of something. But, um, but you, you know, like back to the bubble stick again. But the second, you know. The second he feels too much, uh, you know, goodwill in the room is probably the moment he's going to split. You know, um, it's probably sort of, you know, that much um, love and attention is probably worth bailing on for, for somebody like him, which is, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but it does. This is what brings into question the hypothesis of this movie, that the only way for a person to achieve enlightenment, what Dodd calls an inherent state of perfect, is if you live your life following a master. Freddy leaves because he can't deny his inner animal any longer. But instead of feeling isolated and defensive like he did at the beginning of the movie, he accepts himself for who he truly is. When you deny animal behavior, as Dodd suggests we should, all it seems to do is suppress something that will eventually erupt. I don't think they see something, they feel something in each other, I think it's a sense of each other, and, and, uh, and I, I think they identify with each other, I think they're polar, I think they're, they're, they're coming from different places, but I think that they, they were born of the same thing, they were born of the same thing, <laughs> they're, both, they're both wild beasts, I think, ultimately, one of them has just tamed it somehow and, and he's trying to teach other people how to do that but ultimately that's where the doubts and the, you know, the whole, whole reluctant prophet that comes in you know so ultimately he wants to be wild like uh like freddie is you know so there's this there's this real attraction there over that that those two very things wanting to tame and still wanting to be wild and i think that's basically what life is so, Freddy leaving was a good idea, but I think what's so great about that last scene is that there is an undeniable connection between Lancaster and Freddy. So when he leaves, he is free, he is his own master, but he will lack that special connection that only he had with Lancaster Dodd, as the final song's lyrics suggest. We were During my research for this video, I noticed that Paul Thomas Anderson would mention time travel a lot. And I didn't think too much about it at first. All I thought he was talking about was time travel within the context that any period piece is a form of time travel, right? Because you watch it and are transported away. But as I thought about it more and did more research, I realized how important this idea of time travel is to understand the movie. The trauma therapy that Dodd prescribes is, in a way, a method of time travel. Like, as we uncover trauma in our past selves and past lives, we can better understand who we are now. Dodd has undertaken the astronomical job of exercising the grim specters of mankind's past so that 
A mortal like Freddy can coexist with the memory of Doris. However, the film leaves us with the ultimate understanding that while you can uncover the past, you can never reclaim it. Now for as much as I love the dude, I don't think Dodd would make a very good friend. He is a man fascinated by the mysteries of the world and who longs for an audience to follow him into the great unknown. Unfortunately, the master's fatal flaw is in the audience he eventually attracts, who, after being hooked by Dodd's fascinating questions, begin to ask for their answers. But as we've already seen, that's the last thing Dodd wants to do. It's no accident that the downfall of the cause, the point in time at which Freddy leaves the organization, is at the precipice of Dodd's new publication, entitled The Split Saber a book that functions to answer the questions posed in his last book. The allure to his questions is the prospect of being able to go back in time and take back something that was lost. But the answer Dodd is tiptoeing around, and the one Freddy is greeted with at the end, is that you cannot ever truly go back. Freddy's longing for Doris is made all the more upsetting by Anderson choosing to show the relationship exclusively through flashbacks. We never see them together in the present because to Freddy, Doris is just an uncovered memory, having more in common with a sculpture made of sand, something that will eventually be taken away by the ocean. But while Freddy still longs for her after the movie ends, we can rest easy knowing that he belongs to himself and Doris belongs to the sea. <laughs>